Hello, and welcome back to Patrick Replies, the show where I, Patrick, uh, reply to your comments, and I answer your questions and stuff like that. Now, usually, these episodes are tied to the main episodes of, like, like the actual video essays on the main channel. Um, but because the one January video was a bit different, like it wasn't part of the ongoing season, it was the class on how to analyze movies, and also because there were so many questions that were like building up in the Ask Patrick channel on our Discord server, which is available to members of the Patreon. I realized that I should just do a video now and just cover all of those questions from the Ask Patrick channel. So that's what this is. This will hopefully be a, a shorter one of these videos than they usually are, so less than an hour. Um, because yeah, we have a smaller collection of questions and um, none of these, well, Maybe one. Anyway, maybe one of these actually pertains to the new video. The rest are just general questions. I've done so many Q&A videos in the past six months. I usually do one a year. Anyway, let's see what our first question is. Okay, uh, Mortimer Menander, a great name, says, Patrick, if you were put in the Criterion Closet, what would you grab? Okay, so if I am remembering correctly, in the Criterion Closet videos, where usually important, noteworthy, film-related people visit the offices of the Criterion Collection, they go into the, the closet that has every Criterion Collection movie, um, if I remember correctly, aren't they usually just like picking ones that they really like, like, their favorite movies in the Criterion Collection, kind of like their recommendations, because presumably they probably already own copies of them. It's not just like, ooh, you're there, you know, like, like what free, what free movies are you gonna grab? That's how I'm approaching this anyway. And so what ones would I grab? Well, um, I, I, I would have to be very on brand, and I, I would have to grab one of the out-of-print Criterion Collection DVDs of the Michael Bay movies that they have in there, I would grab The Rock. So we'd get the DVD of The Rock. Um, let's see, what else? I would grab uh, The Black Stallion, which is great. Brian De Palma's Blowout. Charade by Stanley Donnan. Is it Donnan or Donan? I'm never sure. What else? I'm trying to have like a nice variety of picks here. Wait, if I could, I, could I get all like out of print stuff? I know it seems silly to grab DVDs uh, and not Blu-rays, but uh, I want to have one of the Criterion Collection copies of RoboCop and uh, John Woo's Hard Boiled, which are those are both in there. Emma, I'm sorry. I know you're editing this. I'm going to go look at my shelf really quick and come back in. I'm not going to bother cutting because I'm lazy. Um, I'm also going to grab Rafifi, Francis Ha, uh, the Three Colors Trilogy. I could just go on all day. Broadcast News, Night of the Hunter, Brazil. Uh, Brazil's definitely on there. Rushmore. Anyway, uh, that's probably enough. I'll stop now. Sambo is Person says, sister question, if they were going to make a hypothetical Night of the Coconut Criterion, what special features would you have with it? Ooh, in an ideal world, the best special feature that I would love to have would be a full in-depth making of documentary. Because if I'm being honest, while I am very proud of the movie, I think a documentary documenting like the whole production of it would probably be better than the actual movie just because it was such a a weird process, but we can't do that. I, I guess we could have a special feature that would be like uh, an oral history, like a, like a telling of the whole process with just like a, a lot of like talking heads intercut. Um, that could be fun. Um, I would love like a mini featurette breaking down the development of the, the song one, two, three, four, five, six, the pop song that Chloe e sings in one scene because that was so strange, because, like, Chloe basically improvised a song on set, but we didn't really record audio, and then I decided that I did want to hear the song, and so I asked her to 
just like record vocals to like sync up with her mouth moving on set and then she did that but then also like arranged backing vocals and then brian like produced the whole thing so we got a whole professional sounding song that began with just like no audio being recorded and like a goofy thing being improvised on set. That, that and that to me was all really cool. It would be fun to have little mini documentaries uh, breaking down really the stuff that I was less involved in. So like uh, the making of like the puppets and the the Charles origin sequence uh, stuff like that. Obviously, um, if it would be a Criterion Collection release, it would have an essay, and and the essay would presumably be by someone uh, smart who likes the movie. So. It would be fun to read that. Obviously, we have bonus features like the commentary tracks and extended scene that are available on Nebula now. Armando Marchetti says, If Stanley Kubrick was still alive today, do you think he would have followed the mostly practical no-digital route, or would he have liked the possibilities of digital cameras and VFX? That's a good question, and it's, it's an interesting hypothetical because... Stanley Kubrick only really made one movie in the era of digital effects, uh, and that was still in the 90s. Two aspects of him as a filmmaker uh, are that, on the one hand, um, as we all know, he loved doing tons and tons and tons of takes. And on the other hand, he did like having really extensive sets for the actors to get immersed in and to help their performances. So I don't think he would want to go like the all green screen route where you can change everything in post. I think he was a guy who liked finding things on set and liked being able to, you know, help the actors discover things. And so I would actually predict that he would become kind of like David Fincher and and switch to shooting with digital cameras because uh, without having to worry about film, um, it it makes it easier to do tons and tons and tons of takes because you can just like delete them, you can review them more easily. Uh, they're just on hard drives, and I think he would like that part of it. Um, and then also in the Fincher thing of. Uh, of knowing when to use digital effects to like to enhance uh, the stuff that you're shooting, but generally not have scenes that are like dominated by visual effects. That's my guess for how Kubrick would do it. The thing of of people being like, you know, taking like the Christopher Nolan approach, um, that seems to me much more like a younger generation of filmmaker, someone who who kind of grew up watching Kubrick movies, but generally people who were like more of Kubrick's generation or closer in age to him, whether they be like, you know, Coppola or Spielberg or, or Scorsese, um, those guys tend to uh, like to understand the balance of, um, of how to use new technology and integrate it with their more classical way of working. And I, I think that's what he might do, but we'll never know. We Teeth says, are you going to go see Barbie or Oppenheimer first? That's a good question, because as we all know, they open on the same day. Um, so if we're going to assume that they both get great reviews, so the word on both of them is really good, um, so I'm equally excited for both of them, I'm going to do Oppenheimer first, so it's like a good, rich meal. And then see Barbie next like a wonderful, delightful dessert. Zim Show says, in the Christmas Q&A, you mentioned your parents met in Saratoga Springs. Did you know there is a Saratoga Springs themed hotel at Walt Disney World? There are horse racing references scattered throughout, including in the rooms themselves. Uh, yes, I am aware of this. Uh, I haven't been to Disney World since maybe when I was in high school at some point. It's been a while. My sister and I were there. Uh, my, my aunt took us to Disney World, and we stayed at another one of the resorts. I remember seeing the Saratoga one, because also, while my parents met in Saratoga Springs, then they also, like, settled there. That is where I'm from. That's my hometown. And, um, but yeah, I've always been kind of fascinated by this. I would, I would love to, to just do a trip down there. Man, I should, like... 
convince my sister to go with me on a trip. We'll just be like, let's let's go to Disney World, but stay in the weird hotel that's themed on our hometown and see what that's like. Because I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Also, those Disney hotels are very nice. But yeah, what a weird idea. Like, all the others have, like, you know, bigger, more elaborate themes. And there's one that's like, oh... Uh, here's a, a hotel in Florida based on a town in upstate New York. It's weird. Roe says, Hi Patrick, beyond Lemon of Troy, as prominently discussed in your How Does a Perfect Simpsons Episode Work video, what are your other favorite Simpsons episodes? So, uh, I mean, you've, you've, you know, brought up a dangerous topic because I could just talk about The Simpsons forever. I will say, I think... I think Lemon of Troy being my favorite Simpsons episode is maybe my hottest Simpsons take in terms of like that's it's it's that's an episode that's well liked but it's not generally ranked among like the absolute top tier and I think the rest of the ones that I love are the usual ones that people love. So like Last Exit to Springfield, Cape Fear, I mean Marge versus the Monorail obviously, like Rosebud, um, I think Homer at the Bat is the single funniest episode. A thing I've realized about myself is, like, there's certain types of episodes that I love. I always like itchy and scratchy related episodes. Um, so, uh, The Front and the Itchy and Scratchy and Poochie show. Those are, those are some favorites. I love Sideshow Bob episodes. Um, I mentioned Cape Fear, but I think Sideshow Bob Roberts is one of the show's best episodes and also a sh like shockingly great I shouldn't say shockingly but like it's a, a really great like political comedy that is still like shockingly relevant today uh especially when it comes to like elections and the Republican Party um that's a really great one I'll I'll, I'll stop there um uh, and who are your favorite non Simpsons family characters okay my favorite Simpsons character is Millhouse. Um, then any characters voiced by Phil Hartman are like the best. Lionel Hutz is my favorite. I love Lionel Hutz so much. Troy McClure, so great. Lyle Landley, who's only in one episode, but he's the best. I love Chief Wiggum. I really love Chief Wiggum. Uh, I love Edna Krabappel. Um, oh, I, I, I forgot to mention the episode I Love Lisa. Uh, an another obvious classic, but, um, Ralph is a character that I, that, that can, like, you know, he's, he's easily memeable and stuff like that, but, he, yeah, Ralph at his best is so funny, and I Love Lisa is Ralph at his best. Um, okay, I'll move on now. Armando Marchetti is back. Uh, when you mentioned the weird geography of the New York chase scenes in John Wick, it made me think of Bay's Six Underground, where the car turns a corner and suddenly teleports from Florence to Siena for a single shot. If for logistical reasons they had to shoot in nondescript streets of random towns, nobody would have noticed. Instead, they showed Piazza del Campo, uh, and among the similar-looking old towns in Italy, that place uh, that place is a landmark like the Tower of Pisa for its unique shell-like shape. And it's not like non-Italian viewers are not familiar with it. It's the location for the horse race in Quantum of Solace. To be fair, the horse race in Quantum of Solace is edited so terribly that you can that the location is, like, never on screen long enough for your eyes to really register it. It would be like seeing John Wick turn a corner in New York City and popping up in front of the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. So, is it deliberate? Did Michael Bay just need a big square for the car to drift and simply doesn't care? We'll never know, unless you have him as a special guest director for the next video. So, as far as the wacky geography here, um, I... He of course, I don't know for sure, because I have never asked Michael Bay about it, because I don't know him. Um, here's my guess. I would bet, like, ten bucks on this. I bet that Michael Bay laid out everything he wanted to happen in the car chase. He's like, I want I wanted to, you know, like, this gag here, and then we wanted to do this, and then we want this crash here, and then this thing flips over here. I bet he laid it all out and then said to his locations team, find me locations where we can do all of these things. And then they pieced it together from uh, different cities. The thing about this is uh, because so many movies have, especially in cities, have like wacky geography. I think it's something the filmmakers are always aware of where they're like, this will annoy a small portion of the audience that is from this specific place. 
but no one else will actually care. And um, and I think that's a trade-off that they're fine with. It's like th they they put like the quality of the movie ahead, like like as like the top priority as a thing that most people will not notice or care about. And it's and you know if some <laughs> if some people <laughs> in one city in Italy get annoyed, you know it's worth it. That's my assumption. Mr. Butterface, Patrick. Loved the 80s vid and the replies follow-up. It had no chance of winning, but since you mentioned it, Quicksilver is delightfully 80s. Popcorn worthy. Kevin Bacon loses it all as a stock trader, so he naturally becomes a bike messenger in hilly, gritty San Francisco. Bike messenger, usually wearing a vest and a beret. 80s top-notch casting of Jamie Gertz, Paul Rodriguez, Louis Anderson, and a young Larry Fishbourne. Roger Daltrey of The Who and Peter Frampton contrib contribute to the soundtrack. Bonus, Bacon calls it the low point of his career. Well, you've sold me, Mr. Butterface. Um, I will say, like, I, I, I will now put Quicksilver on the list of movies that I learned about when researching the 80s video, but decided not to watch because I was pretty sure they wouldn't quite make it, but that I still am interested in watching at some point. So, you sold me. Sambo is person. Ooh. This is a tough one, guys. How would you rank the Taylor Swift albums? You can consider Taylor's versions the main version if you want. Okay, ranking Taylor Swift albums. So one thing I should say up front that will annoy some people is um, I'm not going to count the, the first few, al the, the albums before Red, because I'm not as familiar with them. I jumped on board the Taylor train. Is that a weird thing to say? Um, I became a Taylor Swift fan during the Red era. Um, and the stuff before Red, while I can recognize the quality songwriting, the teen pop country sound of it has never quite been my thing. And so I just haven't listened to those as much and I'm not as familiar with them and really can't rank them. So I'm sorry. There you go. I'm not, I'm not a real fan. Anyway, in terms of the others, okay, number one, this is a boring choice, but I'm going to put 1989. Um, because with the exception of Bad Blood, which I don't think is a very good song, I think the rest of it is pretty immaculate. Like an all-timer pop album. I think it's amazing. I love it. Number two, I'm going to put Red. Uh, Red, I will say, I think, I think Red has you know, a little bit of filler on there. I, I, I mean, uh, just, you know, there's a few songs where I'm just like, eh, it's fine. And I've never been crazy about uh, I Knew You Were Trouble, but so much of that album is incredible. Uh, State of Grace, I think, is still the best opening track she's ever done. And the, ta oh, actually, no, we're doing Red Taylor's version because... It has the 10 minute version of All Too Well, which is probably the best song she's ever done. It's a masterpiece. Okay, number three, uh, Folklore. And number four, Evermore. I love them both. And I give Folklore a slight edge, a slight edge, um, because I, I, I found that I, while I, I, I like pretty much all the songs on both, um, I think they're her most consistent albums, like front to back. Uh, I slightly prefer uh, the Jack Antonoff produced ones, and he has more on Folklore. Then you have the next three, and the next three, I don't dislike any of them. Okay, so I'm going to put in number five, num in fifth place, I'm going to put Midnight's. Because I think it's the most consistent all the way through of these. There's there's no songs that I dislike on it, um, and I can't say that for the other two. Uh, I think it's like sonically and thematically consistent. Wow, that sounded really pretentious. Um, and I think there's some pretty great stuff on there. In particular, uh, Antihero, You're on Your Own Kid, Mastermind. Maybe I'd put Labyrinth up there too. Really, really good. Then, then number six, I'm going to put Lover, uh, which 
the thing about Lover is if you if you just cut like a few shitty tracks, it would it it, it might be a, a, a slot higher. If you got rid of me, you need to come down and London Boy, because there's some there's some really good stuff on there, like Paper Rings, Cruel Summer. There's there's some really good stuff. Um, and then number seven, I'm gonna put Reputation, which I feel kind of bad about because like. Eh. You know, everyone shits on Reputation, and I think Reputation is interesting. Um, it has some of her worst stuff, like Endgame, and uh, and Look What You Made Me Do. And here, my thing with, with Reputation is, um, I think it gets good when it moves away from the stuff that's all, that's about, like, what other people think of her and celebrity and image and stuff like that and reputation. And when it gets more personal um, with stuff like Delicate, uh, Getaway Car, uh, Call It What You Want, New Year's Day, that's, that's like a good album. And I wish the whole thing were like that. Anyway, there you go. I have ranked seven Taylor Swift albums and uh, I, I will say, I'm really looking forward to, to the Taylor's version of Reputation. I really want to know what that's going to be like. Also, I'm not going to lie, I do like Ready For It, which a lot of people hate. Anyway, Gabby DeBoer says, Are you really the Terrence Malick of YouTube? I consider you more the Steven Soderbergh of YouTube. Uh, no, I... <laughs> okay, the, the Terrence Malick of YouTube thing, um, I will explain that. Back in 2011, when I started the channel, um, in the about section on the channel, uh, and this is still there to this day, I wrote pretty much the Terrence Malick of YouTube because I thought it was funny. This was also like right around when Terrence Malick released, uh, the tree of life. And he, like before he got prolific and was making a bunch of movies back to back after that, when he was still in his mode of like maybe making one movie every decade. And because, you know, YouTube is always pushing you to like release videos all the time. Like, back then I was making videos weekly, and I was like, what is, what even would be the Terrence Malick of YouTube? What would be the equivalent of his release schedule? It just seemed like a funny idea, and he's such a kind of, like, mythical director uh, with such a, like, distinct style that, to me, it seemed funny because, like, the Terrence Malick of YouTube just made no sense, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, so I just left it on there forever. Uh, so I, that's very nice of you to, to say you consider me the Steven Soderbergh of YouTube. I mean, you know, he's uh, one of my favorite directors. He's an influence on my work. Um, I physically resemble him a little bit. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, when it comes to YouTube, I, I find it jet, like pretty hard to, to map, like, feature film directors onto, like, YouTube creators. Like, I have no idea. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know. Feel free to tell me who I'm like. Mads says, What directors do you think are best at handling a longer runtime? Alternatively, which are best at packing a lot into a short runtime? Okay, who makes long movies? Um, James Cameron? I, th I think James Cameron earns the length of his movies. He, you know, you, you feel like you really had, like, like a fulfilling experience there when you sat for three hours. David Lean, who, uh, <laughs> did not make very lean movies. I bet I'm the first person to ever make that joke. Um, he's an obvious one. Uh, yeah, let's go with them for now. Um... Uh, oh, and, and who's good at making short movies? Am I misremembering this, or didn't John Carpenter make pretty tight movies? I feel like a lot of his movies were around 90 to 100 minutes. That's a, a good length. Yeah, let's say John Carpenter. Okay, Armando Marchetti, back again. Today I learned David Fincher and Kathleen Kennedy discussed the possibility of him directing Star Wars episode... Uh, episode 7. Nice. Uh, apparently he wanted to make it like Empire Strikes Back, his favorite, and he saw the series as, quote, the story of two slaves, C-3PO and R2-D2, who go from owner to owner, witnessing their master's folly, the ultimate folly of man. I love how my boy David has zero chill. Jokes aside, do you think he would have been the right choice? 
As much as I would absolutely be interested in seeing a David Fincher Star Wars movie, I don't think uh, that was ever in the cards. Look, Fincher started his career, or started his feature film career, making an installment in an ongoing franchise, had a bad time, and, uh, and has then never even come close to doing that again. Actually, there was that weird time where he was attached to make a World War Z sequel, uh, and my guess there was that he was just having trouble getting other movies financed, uh, and maybe his buddy Brad Pitt was like, come on, do it. I'll make sure you have, like, total control. But in general, like, I think Fincher likes to do his own thing. He has his own way of working. His movies look and feel a certain way. And the thing about making a franchise movie, especially if it's an installment in a long-running franchise, like a Star Wars movie or a Marvel movie or whatever, there will always be compromises you have to make in terms of how the movie looks, in terms of story decisions, uh, in terms of casting, stuff like that. And I don't think Fincher wants to compromise, and I don't think he would have a good time doing that. As much as I would like to see, you know, his Star Wars movie, I don't think he ever seriously considered it. I bet he took the meeting just to be like, because I bet he, he knew Kathleen Kennedy just from being around. Uh, you know, he used to work at ILM, so I bet he was like, yeah, sure, I'll go in. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll chat with him, but I, I don't think he ever really thought about it. Okay, Gabby DeBoer, back again, jumping off from the last question uh, about Fincher's episode seven. I may have found Pat's subject if he ever wants to do a Lynch video, what would their Star Wars movie have looked like? A video chronicling directors who were approached to direct Star Wars films or were even let go from them, and considered what it might have been like by looking at their style, but also considering how some of these more autorial directors would have worked as directors for hire. The reason I connected to Lynch is that he was famously asked by George Lucas to direct Return of the Jedi, which he turned down to make Dune instead. The reason I'd also like to see Pat tackle a subject like this is that I know he'd also be quite realistic about what to expect from them. Well, thank you. I think if Lynch directed Return of the Jedi, I think it would be a bit better than the movie that got made. But I also do not think it would be radically different. Especially at that point in his career, Lynch did Lynch was like, you know, an up-and-coming director who, you know, who had made a couple acclaimed movies, but uh, he wasn't like David Lynch yet. And um, and this is a work for hire thing where he still would have had George Lucas like looking over his shoulder the entire time and uh, and kind of steering him in, in certain directions. And so, yeah, I, I think Lynch's Return of the Jedi, um, hopefully it would have had, like, just better lighting and not been shot kind of like a boring TV movie a lot of the time. Uh, but I think the, like, the Lynch flourishes would probably just, just be down to stuff like maybe uh, some, like, weird aliens in Jabba's palace that he might have a hand in in designing. Maybe some like uh, some specific shots and like transitions in the throne room with like you know the emperor trying to like get through to Luke or whatever. I could see him having some fun there. But like the thing is, if you look at Lynch's Dune, that is pretty much Lynch trying to make a like a big mainstream you know adventure movie. Uh, there are like little Lynchy things in it, but. You know, most of it doesn't really look or feel like like his other movies. Uh, again, this gets back to what I was saying before about there's that you know element of like compromise when working uh, in this kind of franchise. And so, and yeah, and yeah, and and especially something like Star Wars. You look at it now with people who who got fired or whatever, and like you know, you've, it kind of has to be this like this narrow thing you uh you you have to there's like this needle that you have to thread where it has to fit into um i guess what the the audience and the studio expects this type of movie to be and so 
There you go. Rabbi Perfected says, have you seen HBO's Generation Kill miniseries? If you have, what were your general impressions of it? I've actually always wanted you or Mikey to do a video on it, but I just missed out on TTTOTTT. If you haven't seen it, what do I have to say to convince you to watch it? No, I have not seen Generation Kill. I've always heard it's very good. There's just a lot of television, and maybe one day I'll get to it, but uh, I have not yet. That's the best answer I can give you. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm not saying I won't watch it. I just haven't gotten to it yet. There's a lot of shows I haven't gotten to. Adrian Vom says, Would you consider offering audio-only versions of the Patrick Replies videos as a podcast feed? Since they don't tend to be very visual, I'd love to be able to listen to them on the go. What are you talking about? Like, you know, don't you want to look at the texture of my sweater and, uh, and see <laughs> what frame of a video I have on the screen behind me? Um, no, you're right. Uh, they're not very visual. As far as releasing these as podcasts, um, I'm open to the idea. What this really comes down to is enough people need to make it clear to me that they are interested in this and that they genuinely want it for me to be able to justify the extra time it would take to make that. So if a lot of you want that, if you want, if you, if you want to listen to me saying all this stuff while you're in the car or on the subway, um, let me know. Um, I don't know, get organized or start a long thread in the comments. Do whatever you need to do. Um, but if, if a lot of people want it, I'll do it. Sambo is person says, how would you rank all six George Lucas movies? Man, the rankings today. This is actually much easier than ranking Taylor Swift albums. Okay, all six George Lucas movies. Uh, number one, uh, Star Wars, episode four, A New Hope. Um, that, that's kind of got to be it. But a close second is American Graffiti, which I think is a wonderful film. Number three, THX 1138. Haven't seen it in a while, but uh, yeah, that's number three. And then four, five, and six are the Star Wars prequels, uh, which are movies that I am fascinated by, movies that I love talking about, movies that... I don't particularly enjoy watching. Um, I think the the story that are telling on paper is very compelling. I don't think the movies tell it especially well. Um, I have a ton of respect for those movies, even if I'm not really crazy about them. And so my ranking of these, which is maybe my hottest Star Wars take, and it makes people mad. But can you believe it? A Star Wars take making people mad? Anyway... Um, so number four, The Phantom Menace. Number five, Attack of the Clones, and six, Revenge of the Sith. To be fair, five and six could almost be interchangeable. I don't have super strong feelings about those. My basic take on the prequels is that I think Phantom Menace is more fun to watch because it's basically just trying to be like a fun kids adventure movie and there's like a lot of like, new things being thrown at you all the time. New aliens, new monsters, new locations, new worlds, pod racing, you know, uh, lightsaber battles and stuff like that. It's also shot on film and is way more pleasant to look at than uh, 2 and 3. Um, and I think the more they try to be, like, serious dramas, they the more they fail at that. Um, and Revenge of the Sith is really going for... For, for, for big, serious drama that I don't think it pulls off. Um, anyway, go yell at me about my Star Wars opinions. Uh, sorry. Elliot Gammons uh, has a related question. Would you ever go, why have you never been on the George Lucas talk show? Because they get, like, real guests. Like, they're, uh, like... Like their December um, episode, the uh, the Life Day one, which I I I I wasn't able to make it to in person. Their guest was Rachel Zegler, like Maria from West Side Story. She's she's, she's gonna be a Snow White. She's a Disney princess. Um, I'm just a doofus on YouTube. Yeah, they get like great, real, famous, interesting guests, 
And, um, I mean, like, you know, I, uh, like, I, yeah, I'm just a, a fan of the show, and, you know, I'm friends with Griffin. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, if they, if, uh... Why have I never been on? Um, well, I mean, like, if they asked me, I would say sure, but then I would also be like, did everyone else in the world drop out? Um, because they can get way better people. No, I have, I have no expectations of, of being on the show. I just, uh, you know, look forward to attending the next uh, live New York one. Armando Marchetti, back again, Fincher streak. Do you think Benoit Blanc as a character is sort of an exaggerated version of the dorky himbo energy of Daniel Craig's Blomkvist in Girl with the Dragon Tattoo? Love him in that movie. I think it's one of his best performances. That never occurred to me before. Um, I, I don't really think so. Um, I think they're pretty different. You're not wrong about uh, Blomkvist having, like, dorky himbo energy, as you put it. Um, I think... I wish that character was more interesting. I wish I, I was a bigger fan of Fincher's Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Because uh, back back in the—I think like back when they came out, um, I read the three books in the series. I watched the three Swedish movies. And I was all excited for Fincher's version because, like, the first book, it's, like, fun, but it's not great. And I thought this would, would be a perfect opportunity to get something like Jaws or The Godfather, which are famously, like— fun but not great books, but then where a lot of changes were made uh, with the scripts for the movies, and they were turned into masterpieces. And I was like, oh man, if they just, you know, improve upon the source material and like, you know, restructure it and, uh, and, and, and get rid of the problems with it, then it could be a great movie. And it was an extremely faithful movie that still carried over to me, like, all the problems with the book. And one of those problems is that Mikhail Blomkvist is, like, a not very interesting, like, kind of obvious self-insert character for Stieg Larsson, the author, uh, where he's a journalist, just like Larsson was. And, uh, but he's just, like, an awesome guy who's, like, taken down evil corporations and also every woman wants to sleep with him. And, uh, and, like, I don't know, it's, like, fine, I guess, but uh, I don't I don't think the character is all that interesting, and I think most of the stuff that seems interesting about him is stuff that Craig is bringing to the character, and uh, I would have liked it if the movie had kind of just, like, built him out into a more compelling lead. I don't know. That's just me. Exerel. Exerel? Um... I'm sorry that I'm, I'm, I am I'm don't know how to pronounce this. Once we know which topic won, T-T-T-O-T-T-T, we do. It was Muppets. I'd love to know if any topics gave you ideas for future videos and which ones in particular. <sighs> well, um, look, what I've said before is the 16 topics that I picked to go on the bracket were all topics that I would be totally happy making into actual videos. Some of them seem like they could be a lot of fun. I will say, one, one topic that is definitely never going to be a video now was the one uh, Patrick pitches his DCEU um, because James Gunn's lineup for DC Studios just came out like a couple days ago. And so <laughs> the idea of pitching it now seems pointless. Um, so yeah. Never gonna make that one. Um, but I don't know. It would, uh, you know, maybe maybe we'll find some way of, like, uh, you know, picking one of the losers to turn into a real video. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Anything's possible. The Sorcerer So-So says, Okay, so, now that I can proudly call myself a patron to one of the hottest sci-fi directors of 2022, it's how I introduce myself to strangers now, and yes, one of, you just had to go up against the Daniels, it's true. It's time to get to work on your auteur cred. What are three other genres you would like to take on? Okay, I'll, we'll start there. Three other genres I would like to take on. Um, let's say... Uh, I'd like to make a heist comedy. I'd like to make an action movie. I'd like to make a horror movie. I'll even go a step further. 
I'd like to make a sci-fi action movie. There you go, four. And what would be the creative or stylistic thread that would run from Night of the Coconut and on through them to help solidify the concept of Willemsesque? Okay, so this is not me, like, dissing the question or anything, but I think deciding, like, before you make movies, like, what your calling cards are going to be, like, 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 what are, like, these are going to be, like, my, like, my recurring visual flourishes. These will be the, like, the, um, the signature moves that everyone knows. This was one of my movies. That feels like a, a bad way to approach filmmaking. It's kind of, like, letting your own ego, uh, come before the storytelling. Um, and so, to answer your question, I have no idea. Uh, I don't think I would do it that way. Um, maybe I, if I get to make any of these movies, um, maybe there would be nothing connecting them all. Maybe I'll just be a journeyman director who makes movies that you'd never guess were by the same people. Um, or maybe I will have recurring like visual elements uh, or you know, our thematic through lines that will connect them all, um, but it is far too early to say. I just hope I th that I get to make m more movies. Hopefully with bigger budgets. Tangentially, what historical figures would be the protagonists of your own RRR-type epic? Oh, man. <sighs> um, I'm probably not the guy to do this. They should probably uh, get, like someone from Ireland to do it, but um, Irish history, especially when you go back, like, like not just like, oh, you know, the Troubles and stuff like that, but like going back to like medieval times. And also Irish mythology has so much good stuff that should be movies. Like, like where's our Ku Cullen movie? You know, w where are movies about like the Tua de Donnan and like the, you know, uh, uh, you know, the Formorians and like Fionn McCool and all, all those guys. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's so many good like Irish stories and, you know, and, and, and figures from those. Um, it would be funny if I made one about Patrick Henry, the, uh, the American historical figure, because my name is Patrick Henry Willems. I think that would be funny. I don't know what the story would be. I just like the idea about doing it with the guy who basically has the same name as me. Anyway, moving on. Basic Dan says, Hi, Patrick. I have a question about films based on true stories and history. Do you think it is okay for films to change information about historical events, even when those events are not well known? On one hand, biopics and true story movies could drive people to learn about the real events and spark an interest. However, if the film ends up being the only source, they could have vastly inaccurate ideas of the real-life events if it's the only source. Do these movies have an obligation to get the facts right? You know, there's no definitive, objective answer for this. The way I look at it is... Okay, there's, there's two things I believe. First of all, um, I think it's the responsibility of any audience member going to see a narrative film based on true events um, to, to be aware that this is not a documentary and should not be treated as a documentary and that um, artistic liberties will always be taken and that uh, if they really want to know like exactly what really happened and... Uh, that then they should go on the internet when they get home and read about it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think people should be expected to do that. Um, and if they do, just watch a movie and treat it like a documentary after doing no research of their own, um, that's dumb and, uh, and irresponsible. But the other thing that I believe is that the filmmakers of these movies based on true stories I uh, should not slander the reputations of real people who uh, did not seem to be 
bad people. Basically, don't don't do anything that's going to make people's lives worse. For instance, um, granted, I, th I think this person had died at the time, but and I also haven't seen this movie, but I remember when the Clint Eastwood movie Richard Jewell came out, and there was some controversy about the portrayal of the character that Olivia Wilde played, um, where apparently she was like, like a reporter sleeping with people for information, and none of that actually happened in real life. Um, and uh, and that that seems like a bad move. Like like if you want to tell that story, in my opinion, change the name of that character and make them a fictional character uh, instead of the name of a real person whose, yeah, whose reputation you are damaging now. So I think with movies like this, the audience has a responsibility and the filmmakers also have a responsibility. So there you go. Pinball Witch says, Hey Pat, I have been showing my partner the Charles Saga from the beginning. She's watched several random episodes with me for the topics, but now we're watching for the narrative together as well. Uh, my apologies to your partner. We just rewatched the episode on Gonzo Blockbusters. So two questions. Any new movies since you feel deserve to be on that list since it came out? Any new Gonzo Blockbusters? So we made that video in, like... August 2020, I think the most recent movies on the list were Alita Battle Angel and Aquaman? I think so. Let's see, what what else would go on there since? I think RRR would make it on, um, even though it's like the only thing that's not, like on the list that's not a sci-fi or fantasy movie, but it's still... Gonzo in so many ways that that deserves to be on there and I think the closest other thing would be Godzilla versus Kong that has that has some Gonzo energy uh you know with like like the world in the center of the earth where everything is upside down and 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 dinosaurs and all that kind of thing where I don't know how highly it would score on the Gonzo scale. <laughs> the very scientific thing that I made up. Godzilla vs. Kong is probably the closest, but uh, I'm not sure it even quite makes it on. Anyway, um, there's my take on that. And, oh, second question. I'm curious if you've ever seen the anime film Redline. No, I have not. I've been meaning to watch that for years. I hear it's amazing. The animation looks crazy. I really should see it. There's just, there's so much anime. It gets overwhelming. And I'm, I, and then I end up just not watching any of it. Okay, Jan the Man says, Howdy, Patrick. Hope the first month of 2023 went well for you. Um, with the MCU gearing up to adapt Fantastic Four, I find myself terrified and excited. On one hand, I love these characters, and I think they deserve a truly excellent movie. On the other hand, the MCU is so hit or miss right now, and with the selection of Matt Shackman, I kind of feel like the movie is going to be another gray-looking mess that's just workable enough to get a fresh tomato meter. What are your thoughts on the possibility of an MCU Fantastic Four movie? What's the chance it's actually great? Do you have anything you'd really want to see? Are there any directors you wish had gotten the job? Any runs from the comic you think are ideal for adaptation? Is there a universe where this movie makes the MCU interesting again? I will, of course, see the Marvel Fantastic Four movie when it comes out. Um, I am somewhat curious uh, about who they cast in it. Um, uh, of course, uh, you know, we all want... Uh, Griffin Newman to be cast as Herbie. So, is, didn't he make a hashtag, Griff for Herbie? Cast Griffin as Herbie. I kind of just expect it to be exactly what you described there. Uh, another gray-looking mess that is just workable enough to get a fresh tomato meter. Um, while there have been Marvel movies I've, I've enjoyed recently, I had a good time with, uh, Multiverse of Madness, um, uh, I had fun with No Way Home. I don't feel especially strongly, positively or negatively, about Marvel these days. Um, you know, I'll still, I'll still watch them all. Um, I'll still generally, you know, have an okay time, probably, at most of them. Um, 
I do think there is absolutely a ceiling to how how good these things can get. Um, and I don't think a Fantastic Four movie made within the studio um, will be like just yeah. I don't think it will be as good as I believe a Fantastic Four movie can be. Um, I mean, what would I like to see? I mean, you know, I, I've thought about this before. I think it should... I, I don't want to see an origin story. I think it should start with them already established. Um, I'd love it to start, like, mid-action scene with them, I don't know, like, trying to escape from the negative zone while, like, Annihilus's monsters are, you know, attacking their ship or whatever. And then, you know, you can do the thing where you see, like, a tour group going through the Baxter building, and there's, like screens that are that are like just like telling the origin of the Fantastic Four and you know their their uh like spaceship flight and how they were bombarded with cosmic rays and all that stuff. You can set up Doctor Doom like as a figure who's like kind of in the background but save him for movie two. Um there's so much good stuff to do. But um you know Marvel has their way of doing things and uh and it works for him but uh but at a cost. I will say I recently bought the two omnibuses of uh, Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four run, which I've never actually read, and um, I'm pretty confident that those comics are going to be way better than any Marvel Fantastic Four movie could possibly be. So I look forward to reading those, and I hope they don't cast Krasinski as Reed Richards. Okay, Armando, another question. This is probably a silly question. I've never been in New York, would love to, so I'm fascinated by the whole movie capturing the essence of New York thing. My question is, does Cloverfield count as one of those movies? It's been a long time since I last watched it, but I remember really feeling the geography and scale of the city. So I have not watched Cloverfield since, like, 2008, and that was before I lived in New York City. Uh, so I really don't know how well it captures it. The one thing I remember is, uh, when it came out, people who were actually from the city complaining about how in the movie they used cell phones in the subways, uh, and th they were like, there's no signal in the subway, you can't use your phone there, and now there is cell service in the subways. So... Uh, I guess that part of the movie has actually aged well. Sambo is person says, what are your thoughts on Richard Linklater and would you ever consider making a Richard Linklater video? I think Linklater is great, even if I don't think all his movies are great. Um, he's always interesting. Um, he's always trying something new and experimenting and making stuff in different genres. Like there's that thing that he has, that he's working on with Glenn Powell. Is it like an action movie or something? I'm interested. Um, yeah, I, I, I love Linklater. Um, I don't see myself making a Linklater video. There's a lot of movies, and I don't see, like, a through line uh, the way other directors do. Because he, he always worked within, like, a relatively low budget. So, so I don't think he's ever had, like, his, you know, his big ambitious swing. He knows that within a certain budget range, he can kind of do whatever he wants, and he kind of stays in that zone. And um, and again, there's just a lot of movies to watch, and so I don't think I have, like, a take on him. So sorry about that. Michael L. says, Hey, Patrick, I was curious when making a list of your favorite films of the year, how much do you allow the way in which you experience the film to affect its standing? For example, uh, if you had a great time seeing a movie with friends, but on a rewatch, you notice it is more flawed than you realized, would you still hold it up as a favorite of that year? I don't think the experience really matters that much for me. Like, if I, if I go see a movie with friends, it's not like we're talking while watching the movie. So it doesn't really impact. I'm still just watching it the same way I would if I was by myself. Um, and even something like RRR, you know, the crowd is like going nuts and getting really into it and like cheering and everything, but that's because the movie is so awesome that it's like making, it's, it's like, like just getting us so excited that we're cheering. The one thing I can think of is that if I had like a bad experience, like 
things happening in the theater that were distracting me from the movie, um, you know, that would impact my enjoyment of it because it would be taking me out of the movie. And then I would just have to watch it again and just like to watch it like without the distraction. Um, so yeah, I hope that makes sense. Robbie the Rad says, Hey Patrick, I know you've expressed before how color rating is one of the more tedious aspects of the filmmaking process for you. Have I? I don't really, I don't find it tedious. I find it kind of fun. But how do you approach color grading when you're making a standard video essay, particularly in the narrative sections? Do you make any deliberate creative decisions in your color grading, or do you opt more for making something look appealing? I shoot everything with Blackmagic RAW files, so I've been experimenting with and trying to figure out good color grading practices, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I enjoy the process, but for me it's also pretty simple, um, because... I do all my color grading within Adobe Premiere. I don't know how to use uh, DaVinci Resolve, so my color grading options are, are already kind of limited. Um, for the, the regular videos, uh, I shoot them all with a Sony a7S III. That's what I'm shooting this on right now. I shoot an S-Log III. I have specifically one small collection of LUTs that I use for these videos. Like, it, it's pretty small. Like, I'm usually only choosing between, like, maybe four or five LUTs to use, and I like to use one LUT through the entire video to have, like, visual consistency. And so, really, the process just comes down to, like, you know, choosing a LUT, making, like, level adjustments in terms of, like, exposure, shadows, uh, you know, curves, stuff like that, and then making the color choices, which are usually pretty simple. I like to kind of, you know, just like lean one direction, like, are we going colder? Are we going warm? Uh, and, um, and yeah, it, it, and then, then generally apply it throughout the video. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not usually getting too crazy. Uh, I've, I, I, you can lose yourself in color grading, just trying out a million looks forever. Um, maybe it's just helpful that I, I don't know more about it, uh, because it forces me <laughs> to, like, have fewer options and work fast. Um, so there you go. Do I add all of these answers with, so there you go? I, I, need, I need a better, you know, wrap-up line. Alan Smithy says, hi again, Patrick. Someone asked you about the upcoming new season of Doctor Who in your Christmas Q&A video, and that inspired me to ask you, have you ever watched the classic series from 1963 to 89? If not, I think you'd really enjoy it. The black and white episodes from the 60s are a highlight. They're often very surreal and experimental. There weren't really rules yet for how you were supposed to do science fiction on TV, since Star Trek was still three years away, so the effects are often really creative. One serial, The Web Planet, is oddly reminiscent of the work of Georges Méliès, with butterfly people and giant ants, good stuff. N not really, no. I think, I think I've maybe seen, like, a couple random episodes of old Doctor Who. My problem with it is, uh, there's just so much of it, and I am a person who, even with shows that, you know, people say you don't have to do it for this, I always, like, feel the need to start at the beginning and go all the way through. It's like why I've never seen an episode of Law & Order. Because uh, I'm like, I can't jump in the middle. I won't know what's going on. I gotta start at the beginning and get the full story. And I know the show doesn't work that way, but this is how my brain works. And so with Doctor Who, I, I feel this compulsion to like, if I'm gonna do it, go back to the very beginning and go straight through. And... There's just so much. It just it seems impossible. So uh, so yeah. I don't know. Maybe maybe one day. But um, it's just oh god. There's so much. As as much as I recognize that it's cool and interesting and there's stuff there I'd really enjoy, it's it just feels overwhelming. The true Alec. I don't know. Please tell me how to pronounce your name. Hi Patrick. What comics are currently on your pull list? Ooh, oh boy. Uh, what comics are currently on my pull list? I read probably too many comics. The thing is, I do have like a lot of uh, pretty boring taste where I do, I, I, I do read a lot of like big two superhero comics. Like um, both the main Bat books are, are good right now. Um, 
Nightwing that Tom Taylor's the writing has been really great. I'm excited for his new Titans series. Um, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about the, the new Superman era that's kicking off. Um, Action Comics uh, is fun right now. I do read basically every, like, Tom King miniseries. Uh, and so, like, um, Human Target has been awesome. Uh, Gotham City Year One right now, currently digging that. Danger Street is interesting so far. Um, over at Marvel, it's like, I read a, a bunch of the X-Books, like Immortal X-Men, X-Men Red, X-Men, X-Force, Wolverine. I think those are the ones that I, I read. Miracle Man, the new Miracle Man. Uh, you know, the, the, the Neil Gaiman and Mark Buckingham runs, finally back. Rules. Oh, uh, I'm digging uh, my buddy Declan Shalvey's new book, uh, Old Dog. Oh yeah, the new issue of Saga just came out. Uh, you know, Saga's great. Um, I'm really liking uh, Little Monsters by um, uh, Jeff Lemire and Dustin Nguyen. The Nice House on the Lake just wrapped up. Um, oh, I do want to say, <laughs> back to just like superhero books, uh, World's Finest by Mark Wade and Dan Mora has been such a blast. That's really good. I don't know, t tell me what other comics right now I should be reading. What am I forgetting? Oh my god, there's there's too many com Oh, the first two issues of Doctor Strange Fall Sunrise uh, by Trad Moore is like, I'm not entirely sure what's happening in the story. Does not matter. It is some of the most staggering, incredible artwork that Marvel Comics has published in like 20 years. They have no idea how to promote it. Uh, it is this really weird, esoteric piece of art. Um, and um, I think everyone needs to look at this thing. I, I hope when the miniseries is done, they collect it in like a really big, nice format because it's just, it, it's it's some really, really cool comics. And, um, and uh, yeah, I just randomly picked it up off the shelf. I didn't even know... It was coming out. I hadn't seen any ads for it. Doctor Strange Fall Sunrise. It's awesome. Alex uh, says, where'd you get that jacket slash sweater? Okay, um, I'm not entirely clear on this. I think this is about just different outfits I have worn in videos. And so what I'm going to do is um, to answer your question, I'm going to look up different recent videos of mine and try to answer your question. Okay, yeah. Got the massive mustard turtleneck, the wide lapel cotton jacket. Okay. Here's the part where, where I will tell you where I got various clothing items that I wore in videos. Here, in the how to analyze movies video, this jacket here is from Spear and McKay. In the Patrick replies to Patrick Explains Ambulance, the, uh, the kind of purplish lavender, uh, striped sweater I have in that is from J. Crew. Uh, the Christmas 22 Q&A, the kind of uh, like mustardy yellow uh, turtleneck I have on in that, that is from Todd Snyder. Um, in the Patrick replies to the the 80s movie video, there's the big chunky uh, orange turtleneck that I think that's from Topman. Um, and anyway, there you go. There is where my jackets and sweaters are from. Oh, and this is from Alex Mill. That was our fashion corner for today. All right, and last question is from Samuel B. Hey, Patrick, I'm curious how you landed on Home Alone as your example movie for the most recent video. I'm sure there were a ton of movies you could use, so I'm wondering what drew you to Home Alone specifically. Did you consider other films to use as well? So the idea for this video, actually, I can't really take any credit for it. Um, back in, it may have been like 2019, uh, Devin from Legal Eagle um, kept telling me to basically make this video, but at the time he was saying I should make it as a Skillshare course. Um, this was before we had Nebula classes. And what Devin said to me was, you should make this class where you take one movie and then use that movie as the example for explaining all the parts of like film analysis and film theory and all of that. Uh, and then, you know, once I finally decided to make it, I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna 
do that exact thing. I'm, I'm gonna pick one movie and that'll be our example for everything. The reason I settled on a home alone, uh, two reasons. Uh, one, I wanted to pick a movie that pretty much everyone would be familiar with. Uh, so when I would reference scenes or characters or whatever, everyone would be like, oh yeah, I'm, I know those. Um, but also a movie where people, you know, wouldn't be like, you know, oh no, I don't want to get spoiled. I, I can't watch this video. And so I'm just like, most people have seen Home Alone. Maybe you watching have not, but most people have seen Home Alone. Um, and, but yeah, and the other reason was that I specifically wanted to pick a really mainstream movie that would not normally get analyzed or taken very seriously or thought of as a movie that has subtext or, uh, or that is, is worth analyzing. Because I feel like some people probably have uh, the notion that like, oh, yeah, like like serious art films, uh, those, those have subtext and meaning and symbolism behind things. But like, you know, silly junk like Home Alone, that has nothing deeper under the surface. Uh, and so I wanted to pick a movie like this and show that, yes, it does. Uh, even the most broad, mainstream, crowd-pleasing, simple family movie still has all these examples of artistry and filmmaking craft and is worthy of analysis because there is tons of stuff to get out of it. And, um, and that was it. That's how I picked Home Alone. And cool, we have now connected it all to the new video. Great. Um, I think this ended up being long after all because there, there were a lot of questions. Anyway, thank you all for tuning in. As always, thank you for sending in questions. If you want to send in questions for the next one of these, um, join the Patreon, and then you get access to the Discord server, and then there is an Ask Patrick channel uh, where you can ask questions for these videos. And um, yeah, that's all. I've got to go back to work to finish the script for the next episode. It's going to be good, and I'll see you soon.